And I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the Associate Dean of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. And I'm so glad that you have joined us either tonight live or later watching the recording for the FNU Virtual Nurse Midwifery Week event. So happy Nurse Midwifery Week, Empower 2019. And specifically tonight, um, I'm your hostess. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, becoming a nurse midwife, about being a student, being uh, thinking about being a student, how to be a successful student, and then what the life of a midwife is like, and the importance of teamwork. And so um, I'm gonna start with a poll. So I'm gonna ask you to answer true or false. So I'm gonna give you kind of the scenario here. I'm trying to figure out how many people we have that are current students and how many people that are considering becoming a nurse midwife. Um, so if you are currently a student, you're gonna answer true to this poll. Okay, so um, most people on are students and we have a few people who are not students yet. So that's great, we've got a good mix. And so um, there are gonna be points. We've also asked some um, currently enrolled students to be here to kind of help share their perspective and their wisdom. And um, I, we get, we'll see what we get. So hopefully you guys won't scare anybody off, you know. So I wanna tell you just a little bit about Frontier. I always come back to what is our mission and it's to provide, and you can read accessible um, education so that you're ready to go out and practice all across the United States in rural and underserved areas, especially diverse populations. And we know that the best care for women and families comes within the um, construct of an effective team. And so all of the, this week, all of the presentations have to do with being a good team player or how do you construct a good successful team. So the first thing that we have to do as educators is to help prepare you to be a good team player, to help you to be competent, and then to understand your role within the team. And so that's part of what we're gonna talk about today as well as like, how do you take this great, wonderful dream that you have, and then how do you bring it into reality? And so I'll tell you that the most rewarding thing for me in my life and my career has been that I've been blessed to take what I really desired and loved and wanted to do and found a way for it to become um, a career, a calling really, and I'm thankful for that. So these are some of the words that come up when you look for anything related to midwife. And so I want you to look at those words. So if you wanted to say, who am I gonna be or what do I need to look like when I am done with my education? These are some of the words that you would, hopefully will resonate with you and would describe you. If somebody had to describe you as a nurse midwife, these are the things that you would wanna be. And hopefully these are the things that we help prepare you to do. So we're gonna talk a little bit about life as a midwife or life as a midwife student. I'm gonna give you some tips and hints. And what I'm gonna ask, cause we're gonna talk first about being a midwife student. Why would you wanna, like, how could you be a successful midwife student? Um, I'm gonna ask if, if a particular slide or comment uh, thread of thinking appeals to you, you guys who've come in specifically who, who responded and said, yes, I'll help. Please put your camera up or your microphone and add to the conversation, especially um, if you have a personal story or a reflection that would help us to understand it better. So um, this is your opportunity, if you have not yet enrolled, to say, I can make a choice about what I'm gonna be and I, who I'm gonna become. And if you wanna be a midwife, that's what we want for you. We, the women and the families need you. We need um, great, competent, well-prepared nurse midwives in our country to help fill some of the gaps. So we do have several entry options. If you have an associate's degree, you can come in. If you have a bachelor's or as a postgraduate, like if you already have some sort of um, uh, nurse practitioner role, you can add midwifery. And then we have those degree options and multiple time frame options. And so um, that just will kind of give you an idea of could, could I qualify for this? You do have to be a nurse first 
and then any of these ways to come in. I will tell you sometimes, however, that you think you're gonna go like that from point A to point B. Seems like it should be a straight path, but most of us have found that that's not necessarily true, that sometimes we have to take alternate paths or we get a little valley there and get to float a minute before we move on. Um, any of our current students have any stories or any wisdom to share about being open to plans that aren't exactly the way you anticipated? So let me tell you a little bit about my life as a student nurse midwife. That's my picture from when I was a midwifery student. The brows were in at that point, ladies. They, it was the big thing to have big brows. Um, but at the time that we that I went to midwifery school and got my master's degree, Frontier did not offer a master's. So you had to get the master's, so a few courses from Case Western. We had a relationship with Case Western whereby they accepted our midwifery courses and we took things like research with them. Well, literally there was a blizzard while we were there and I was dressed about like that because I'm from Georgia, I'm not used to cold weather. So that was me walking uphill both ways to school. And um, I did find that the biggest um, challenge for me was that I already had three children and I was working. So that balancing act um, made me be realistic and stop some time and think about what was realistic. Julie, did you want to share something with us? Unmute yourself, ma'am. <laughs> I just wanted to mention when you're talking about that, that path isn't always as straight and as uh, straightforward as we think it might be. But um, earlier this year, we almost moved across the country and, uh, you know, had to consider some different options as far as what, um, you know, how long the my path would look like in, this, in changing up my plan as far as how many courses per term and those kind of things and um, it ended up working out the way I wanted it to but I didn't know that at the time um, and this, the, the faculty and everybody is fantastic with working with those changes and ups and downs but um, you just yeah that, that, that was kind of my experience this year and um, it was a it was a good experience coming from the fact frontier side of things so Thank you. For those of you who are not students at Frontier yet or who are just getting started, I just want to remind you that the way our program is structured is that you come to campus for Frontier Bound experience. It's like an orientation. Then you do um, your first sections of work at home didactically on the computer like this. That's your book work. Then you come back to campus for a Sunday through Friday experience, getting ready to go into clinical. And then you do your clinical part at the end. And so, um, so sometimes those time frames are different for different people. Somebody who has recently been to Frontier Bound, if you've been to Frontier Bound, which is our orientation in the last, let's say three to six months, will you put your camera up and tell a little bit about that? Sometimes people are a little um, reticent thinking, why do I have to come to campus? I think I hear somebody coming while they're getting their camera and microphone. There we go, Triana's coming. I'll let her tell you about Frontier Bound. Yes, yeah, so Frontier Bound, I was one of those students that was like, why do I have to go all the way to Kentucky and, and meet all these people that I don't, I will probably never see again. And But it was absolutely the best thing to be on, in, on campus and to meet everybody. It, it gives you a sense of, belonging and you get to meet some of the faculty and um, really, really makes you feel like you're a part of the university. So um, I'm really glad that they um, do that here um, at Frontier. So definitely something that you'd want to do. Jennifer, did you have a comment? Uh, I did. I just finished um, my bound um, experience a couple weeks ago. And um, I think across the board, people were hesitant about coming. Um, everybody was expressing like, oh, I really didn't want to do this. But um, you guys at Frontier do such a good job of mixing us up in, in different small groups over the course of the several days that we're there and really giving us opportunity to get to know other students. And when you leave there, you just come away um, feeling like you're supported, feeling like um, 
you know, you're all in this together and not feeling like it's just a, just a distance education program. Um, I mean, so many of us have already checked in with each other and we don't even start classes for a few more days. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as one of the girls said, she felt like she was the only one coming in with life struggles in addition to tackling this um, next level of her education. And then after being there, she realized we all have our struggles. We all have um, the extra luggage that we're uh, to bring into the table and um, we're just excited to motivate each other. And, and, um, and they throw in the history of the program. It just makes you feel like you're a part of something so much bigger than just getting your master's or getting your midwife. Thank you. I appreciate that, ladies. Um, so this slide is about um, the group, the team that surrounds you. So I'm the associate dean, and that means that I'm responsible for the program as a whole. Dr. Audrey Perry is our clinical director. Within the courses, there are course coordinators and course faculty, then there are regional clinical faculty who help you while you're in clinical, and as you prepare for clinical, like figuring out is this the right kind of site, um, you have professional advisors, and of course there's financial aid, and the credentialing coordinators help get your site ready, and we have a new um, group called the Clinical Outreach and Placement Team, and their job is not necessarily to place you in a site, but it's to help you to coordinate your um, search. It's to help, like if we have sites that we're having difficulty communicating with or getting, um, getting all the paperwork together with, then this team can reach out and figure out what it is that they need from us to feel comfortable with our program, help put together a program so that we can reach out to um, larger umbrella entities that, um, that sometimes control whether or not students can go. So they're looking at it from a big picture and to assist the um, faculty and, and you to help make a great clinical plan for each of you. Heidi, I think you were coming up. Did you want to talk about Clinical Bound a little bit or or about um, the team at Frontier? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, so I just attended graduation this weekend um, with my mom and a lot of people's concern coming into like a online program is like, wow, how am I gonna do this without um, people around or teachers that I can talk to all the time? And um, that was my concern coming in Frontier Bound, I'm now in clinical. And I can say that I've honestly been so shocked by how close I felt to my professors and to all the students. My mom even made a comment because she's finishing her CPA online and she's like, I don't know any of my professors and I don't know any students. And I was like hugging professors and seeing other students. And my mom was like in the whole circle up that we do. She was like, wow, you guys are really close for an online program. And I do have to say like I was very pleasantly surprised with that. And I think for people looking into this program, that should put them at ease knowing like you really will be carried through and you will know your faculty and they deeply care about your success. They're not just here to see you as a number or another person coming through. They really, really care about you. And I find that um, really the reason that I love Frontier. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, Heidi. And for those of you who don't know, Heidi was the Kitty Ernst Leadership Award winner for this year. Um, we give out a leadership award for each specialty track at commencement each year, and Heidi won for the midwives this year. And Heidi, you probably don't know that um, a lot of years ago, I won the same award. So, you, so I'm going to say you're in good company, or at least you're in a familiar company. How about that? <laughs> I just am so honored. It's very much an honor for sure. You know, I think one of the reasons that what you said is true, Heidi, that um, that hopefully you feel, each of you feel like you're surrounded by people who care about you is because we're on the same mission. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the same goals, which is to um, put great providers out there to, to open up um, communities to midwifery care so that every woman has midwifery care as an option. And so because of that common mission, it makes it much easier to know that you've got good people around and beside you. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to move into um, a section that's about uh, ways to be successful as a student. And really, some of these are, will, are also, will also help you to be successful in life and in work. 
So um, if anybody, if any of you folks want to chime in, feel, put your face up. I'll know as you're coming up that you have something to say and I'll be, and I want to hear from you. But one of the first things I would suggest in being um, successful is to not forget yourself in the midst of it. It's very easy to get spread so thin that um, you're an empty cup and you can't continue and continue and continue to pour from an empty cup and expect to get anything out of it. So you always do have to have um, some element of self-care. Now, I'm sure that you all remember in nursing school feeling like you had absolutely no social life. And the truth is some of that will have to continue in that there are things you will have to sacrifice. So it's not reasonable. Now I'm not looking at the chat, so I'm gonna to try to pull that up. Oh, congrats, good. Um, I'm gonna read one of these comments. Joanna says, Frontier Band was a tremendous space to develop relationships. It allowed me to feel a part of the community. The warmth and su the support from the faculty was significant. Thank you. Um, what I wanna say about this is you have to make the choices of what stays and what goes in your life, but you have to have space for school. So you can't expect to just stick school in around other things. Is there anybody on the call who is willing to um, be transparent and talk about either things that they had to um, trim back or lessons that they learned if they did not do that initially? I can talk about it. Um, my name is Jasmine. I'm one of the newer people coming into Frontier. Um, for me, currently, I, I did have to scale back a lot with traveling because I'm a big traveler. I don't have any children. And I had a couple of family members where we had a trip coming up very soon. And I had to kind of tell everybody, like, I can't go. I have to put school as a priority. And a couple of people were upset, but they understood. But I think that's the thing about you know, when you decide that you want to take that step to further yeah. your career or to just kind of further your education and anything that you want, you do have to make sacrifices. So I know for me, like the next two years is going to be books, 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 and then work. And then eventually it's just going to be straight books without working. And that's a sacrifice that I kind of have to make. So I have to kind of rearrange my whole life where I have to spend less and you know, do things like that. Because when that time comes, when clinicals hit, and I know I'm not going to be able to work, I have to think, well, how am I going to support myself too? But I know that this is my dream. So it's something that I have to do. That's right. There's very little in life that is worth much that you get for free. And um, so this is worth so much and it will cost, but it's worth the cost. Heidi and Julie. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, first of all, just to know, like, it's a season, like it's not going to last forever. I've had to tell myself that many times during this program, like, this is not going to be forever. It really is just a season. So um, that one thing I was really thankful for um, with Frontier Bound is they talked about how important it was to, um, in your prioritization of your life, to prioritize your family. And if you're married, your marriage. And to, I was so thankful that they were forth right with that. And just talking about like, you need to have a serious conversation with your spouse about what this means and the commitment level and how you're going to prioritize your time with your family because the divorce rate in a master's program is very high. And so I was really thankful for that because my husband and I just got on the same level, you know, really made a plan for how I was going to work full time and be in school full time and have a successful, happy marriage. So, and for many people, they have kids on top of that or grandkids. And so making that plan ahead of time will really benefit you. For me, I think it, um, honestly, there's weeks every term that, that you feel like you haven't quite figured it out again. Um, and so you kind of have to just reevaluate continually and and figure out um, what to do different and each class is a little bit different and what the demands are on your time and um, you know for me I do I have children and I'm still currently work, working full time um, so there's a lot of different pulls for me and um, you have to kind of look and see what things you can give to other people you know my husband's doing and my daughter are doing the most uh, more of the cooking now, you know, and that's an extra hour a day that I can put towards studying. Um, and then also really um, spending good quality time on the breaks between
coming terms with family and making sure you're uh, kind of banking those good uh, good hours with them because it's not as much during that term. And um, I think just reevaluating all the time has been really important for me and, and making the shifts and changes um, just as I need to as we're going along, so. Thank you, those were um, great experiences that you guys shared. And uh, both of you talked a little bit about work and just remember that, um, you know, the best laid plans. I mean, you can imagine, I feel like me, sometimes I plan, oh, I'll do this and then I'll do this and I'll do this. And then if you're working a 12 hour shift or for me, if I've been on call all night, probably when I get done, I may just need to stop and go to bed. And I surely may not be able to put in several more hours of study. So being, recognizing that, um, you know, the what is reasonable and what is not. And remembering if you have children, that that is a priority. Those little people need you and that has to remain a priority for you. Thank you, Heidi, for noting that. And for Julie talking about your family's participation. Yes, those maintaining those relationships are important and that requires time. So being reasonable with yourself about how to do this so that you can um, be well-rounded and happy and successful in all of the areas of your life. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna say something about looking after yourself. And that means making sure that you're resting and eating well and exercising. Um, when you start to allow these things to go, what I have found, and, I, and I'm being a testimony right this minute, is that your energy level is lower because you're not feeding your body well and you're not exercising, you're not resting. And so even though you may be awake and sitting in front of a computer or with a book more hours, those hours are not productive if your body is not fueled well and if it is not in good shape. And so um, what happens is you end up losing time and productivity because of your body not working well for you. Um, and then there are gonna be times that you just need some downtime, that you just need moments, hours, sometimes a day here and there where you're not doing anything except taking care of yourself. So always think about, have I taken care of myself today? Um, have I done something that made me feel better in general so that then everything else uh, works more productively? And then you just mentioned, Julie, about taking, when you do have the time off, you crawl out of your hole like, hello, where are you? To take that time and recharge with, with your families. Okay, so I'm gonna move on just a little bit and you guys please pop in when you've got comments. Um, another thing I'm gonna recommend for success in graduate school is that if you are not using a calendar now, if you're not using a calendar app of some, some um, way, the Google Calendar that you have available through the university with, the, with all the Google stuff is extremely beneficial. You can put things in there and break it down Instead of a to-do list that says something broad, like work on the activity for NM703, specifically, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna do the readings today and write the outline and X, Y, Z? Are you going to, and when you break things down to specific tasks, I think it's much easier to feel successful as you complete tasks, but also to have a better eye on what all is left to be done to complete something um, and to, to keep a better eye on what you're doing. And thank you, I see some questions being answered. Um, I know each person in path is different. Love to know the typical length of study with an RN and a bachelor's. Yes, thank you, Julie, for answering that. It's anywhere from 24 to 30 or 36 months at the most. Great um, options that we have. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. I see y'all are answering each other's questions. I'm gonna believe that if a question comes up that you really need my help on, somebody will pop up and answer because I, I don't always see the chat over here. Um, so it's in the syllabus. Um, one of the first things I would advise you to do at the beginning of every term is to write, figure out really what needs to be done, refer to it frequently, put the important dates in your calendar, then back it up. If I need to have it completed by X date, what do I need to have completed by Y and Z date prior, or A and B, I guess would be prior so that I can really be ready on the date. 
your home study space, you need to have a designated area to work because sometimes this is what we've seen on Proctorio, somebody sitting in a bathroom doing things. Be careful about making sure that you have a space conducive to work um, so that you can be productive um, in your schoolwork. And then I, I'm gonna just advise you, now this is true no matter where you are in the program, and I'm gonna ask if anybody's had an experience like this, if, they, if they'll share it. Be open to seeing the world differently than you have in the past. Be open to having different viewpoints and having light shed on different things. There's gonna be change in you as you pursue your education. Trust that there's gonna be some discomfort along the way, and that's good. It can open your mind to different possibilities and excitement and new areas of learning. And many of us come into a program like this feeling like we know everything. Um, I'm being very transparent here. And then what happens is the light sometimes shines into the shadows of what you may or may not know, or you may not have seen in that way before, and it allows you to grow. So um, somebody that's in clinical, or close to, or clinical bound, has done clinical bound, or is in clinical currently, talk a little bit about your experiences of seeing things differently going into different sites. Yeah, I'm in clinical right now. Um, I guess to start off, yes, you're going to learn a lot. <laughs> I was a labor and delivery nurse, and I think I can speak for a lot of labor and delivery nurses thinking that we know everything <laughs> and um, learn so much, not only like book wise, but definitely coming into clinical. Like I told my preceptor over and over, like, I am so humbled. I am so humbled. Like when you transition into that, like, you are becoming the provider. It's like, wow, like you see things from a totally different perspective. And it's wonderful. Um, I'm really blessed that all my preceptors are actually frontier grads. So they really understand how this program works. And they've been able to be like, oh, yeah, I remember when I felt that way. And this is how I learned. So um, definitely be open to learning. And um, with your different preceptors, they're all going to have different experiences that they come with which will really help you. Like, they'll be like, well, I didn't know this and I learned this. And so um, it'll definitely help you. I'm really enjoying clinical, but learning a lot for sure. You're on mute, Tanya. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I was <laughs> myself. It was so good. <laughs> Please go ahead with whatever you were going to say. Well, I haven't uh, secured my clinical site for sure yet, but um, I'm real excited that I have um, a possibility of doing a clinical in a very busy um, hospital that would be comparable to like a county hospital in other areas. Um, I have found just kind of over the course of my life that when you get out of your bubble, whatever that bubble is that you live in, you get to see things um, so differently and and I am aiming to broaden my horizons. I live in what I guess would be considered a fairly affluent community. And um, pretty much, I would say, just off the top of my head, like probably 80% of the women have prenatal care and, um, you know, have, they're educated about their options for a birth plan, that kind of thing. So I'm looking forward to going into um, the um, poor, um, the south side of Dallas, essentially, and you know, seeing people from um, many different cultures um, that have different ideas on what their birth plan should be or, you know, um, stick with traditional um, plans. And um, women who don't have prenatal care, women that have been exposed to drug use and that kind of thing, because I think that that kind of experience is going to be so valuable in my practice. And um, I encourage everybody to kind of go out of their way to step outside of their comfort zone during clinicals. Thank you. I love that perspective. I had a similar experience, Jennifer. Um, you know, I was, even though I'm in a very, at a very rural, relatively rural area, it is, I don't know that you would call it affluent, but it's certainly upper middle class. And most people, um, you know, do have prenatal care and et cetera, and have options for health care. And my first clinical site was very similar to the kind of population that I had grown up with and that I had seen in labor and delivery. And my second clinical site was more about, more like what you're talking, it was more of a clinic site, um, public access, and it was 
the best site and it changed my perspective about what I wanted to do professionally. Um, what it showed me is that for me, I wanted to do something that I felt like made a difference for people who might not get a difference made otherwise. And, um, and everybody has their own path, but because I broadened what my personal horizons were, it opened me up to other possibilities. And so I really encourage you to think like that. That's great thinking, Jennifer. Um, so your words and your actions take you from where you are to where you want to be. So I'm going to stop a minute. If you're on this call and you are not yet a Frontier student or you're not a midwifery student, even if you're considering another program, and you have any questions right now about either Frontier's midwifery program or the profession of midwifery, like just thinking about, do I really want to be a midwife and should I consider Frontier? I'd love for you to ask them or type them in the chat. And I'll try to be quiet and watch a minute. And then if we don't have any, I'll move on. Feel free to put your camera up if you have one or just unmute yourself and talk to. We've got a lot of folks listening, so you guys may not have the option to talk, but maybe you can um, type in a question if you have one. What are your thoughts about a recent RN, new graduate, applying immediately to a certified nurse midwife program? Um, Amanda, at Frontier, we do require one year's nursing experience before you apply, but I do know that there are programs that that's not the case for, that you go directly from your um, BSN program into a master's. And I think that um, most, well, all of the midwifery programs that are accredited in the United States are well equipped to look after you wherever you are. So the program is set up knowing what your potential experience is. We have a lot of experience, a lot of students who don't have labor and delivery experience. We know it's not required. Now, do you have to learn those things? Yes, you have to learn those things. But can you learn those things? Absolutely, you can. So um, I think that I, I would like for you to wait a year just so you can be one of our students, Amanda. But if there's a program in your community that doesn't require the nursing experience, I think that is perfectly fine. More than anything else, I want to see somebody who is motivated enough to be here today that's not yet a student. I want to see you become a midwife. Um, Jennifer, do you have to do 12 hour clinicals? No, you do not. And can you do it shorter shifts? Yes, you do. I may have to travel two to three hours to find a site. Yes, you can do that. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing less than, okay, let me, let me clarify. It's going to be dependent upon your relationship with the preceptor. So there may be some preceptors that require you do 12 hours, some that require you do a 24 hour call shift, et cetera, because midwifery is a little different in most cases, midwifery is a little different than quote, regular nursing because it is not shift work. So um, most midwifery practices do some office time and those are usually eight hour days, eight to nine hour days. And then they additionally do call. The call may be anywhere from 12 to 24 to 72 hours. I don't know many many, even some um, home or birth center practices, the call may be even longer because the volume is low. Um, so it really is dependent on the site, but no, it's not like you absolutely have to do 12 hour shifts. All right, let me see. Next question. I have a question about midwifery in the cases of emergencies, for example, a C-section, how much are midwives involved? I was able to watch a C-section in a hospital and the midwives were coming in and out. Is it like that in America? Um, in a lot of places it is. In many, many places, the midwives um, are the first assist. So they assist their first assistant surgeon in the surgery. Um, that's not true everywhere. It is not a basic core competency to scrub into surgeries, um, but very often once you're in practice, you either obtain additional uh, specific education or you're trained on the job to assist in surgery. You're not the primary surgeon. Does that answer your question, Emma? And Amanda, Frontier has been my dream for over four years. Another year is worth the wait. -hoo -hoo -hoo, we agree. Um, any other questions about just generally becoming a midwife or about Frontier's midwifery program? We have a few folks typing, so I'm going to wait and let you type. Good, Emma, I'm glad we answered your question. Um, you're on this call either because you're thinking about being a midwife or you're already one of our students. 
And what I would say is that success is out there. You have to go to it. So that, requ that requires action on your part. You have to move toward the goal that you've set for yourself by taking step one and then step two and then step three. Um, and then this is where you end up. And I'm moving on, not because I'm, but because I know people are typing. So I'm watching the chat as your questions come up. Okay, where can I find out what affiliations you have, where that you can get discount memberships to this workshop that taught you how to open your own practice? So for our um, Frontier students, the AABC, How to Start a Birth Center workshop, which is about, which contains a lot of the stuff about opening your own practice, is a part of our tuition. So that may be what you're talking about. Otherwise, uh, we don't have any specific other affiliations. Jennifer, do you think that's what you're talking about? Yes. So the um, tuition to the How to Start a Birth Center workshop is part of the Frontier tuition. There is a um, materials fee that is also required. It's $150, but that is greatly reduced from the general cost to the public. We believe in that. We, we want you to be entrepreneurs, opening your own practices or working within um, practices that are midwife owned when possible. So we just had our commencement as um, I think Heidi was saying a while ago. We're so excited about, um, about our new graduates. We had such, such wonderful success this year. All right, Emma says, I'm interested in becoming a midwife with the US military. Do you know anything about that process? Um, the process as far as the education is the same. You have to be a certified nurse midwife and then you just apply through the military sites. And if you're asking more about the application and job process, I don't know and I don't want to mislead you. What would you say are the biggest frustrations and limitations you experience as a midwife and how do you? Um, perfect segue, Amanda. Thank you. That was my next slide was what are your questions about life as a midwife? Um, Frustrations and limitations. I see we've got some midwives on here. I saw Diana and Tanya uh, Belcheff. I don't know if there are others. If y'all have your microphones where you can talk, please join me in this. But let's see, frustrations and limitations. I, I'm probably the wrong person to answer because honest to goodness, I would choose this career every single day and twice on Sunday. So I, I guess frustrations would be that there aren't additional hours in the day to do births. Um, limitations would be, it is frustrating when you work in an area that midwifery, and I have worked in areas where midwifery was not extremely well known. So to continually feel like you've got to explain who you are sometimes is frustrating. Um, let's see, what else? Oh good, I hope that Tiny Belcheff is talking, I mean is typing. Quality improvement is a slow steady process, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for Jennifer Conrad for noting that for Jennifer Williams. Thus, there's a course in the class in our curriculum called Principles of Independent Practice. Tanya and Diane or anybody else whose name I might not have noticed. What are other um, frustrations would you say with the career itself? Sometimes you want it now. I will say that Amanda, um, it, for some people, the lifestyle is difficult. Um, so what I mean by that, many practices are th one, two, three, five midwife practices, which means that you're covering office and call. So you might have office a few days and then call a few days every week. And babies come 24 seven, they just don't follow our, thank goodness, I guess, they don't follow our schedules necessarily. And so it can be fatiguing. And so you want to make sure that you set yourself up with a group. And when I say that, I mean, as you're job searching, you search for a um, supportive environment whereby people work with one another and you could call on your peers to um, help if there's something going on in your family that's a priority to you so that you can be sure you're not on call. I've been very privileged to work in situations like that where we could um, call on one another and where it was really expected that you did. Like if I was standing next to one of the other midwives and she said, oh, I'm on call Tuesday, but you know, my son has a ball game. I was sure wishing to go. He's going to get to start this week. I would say, no, you are not missing that. I will take that call. You take, we'll figure it out later. Absolutely, Tanya, it's so important to keep, uh, to honor each other's uh, wishes and desires as much as possible. And to, I always like, like I would rather do more for you than I ask of you. 
So how do you handle being on call? Do you stay at your house or when you go out with your family, just keep scrubs in the car and take two vehicles? That's what I do, Jennifer. Um, I go with family I, and um, I actually go into the hospital with my clothes like this on. And we just take two vehicles most places. Occasionally, if it's just my husband and I, he'll say, oh, I don't care. I'll leave if you have to leave. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. But it but it varies from place to place. There are some places that you have to be in house for call if it is very busy call. And those kind of places are often are more shift work type because you don't ever get to leave. So you might be 12 or 24 hours of a shift. Um, Emma, how often do you use a, lose a baby or, and a mother and how do you deal with that? Fortunately, it is very rare. I've been a midwife um, this year. Oh my goodness, 20 years this year. Wow. Okay. That's scary. I've been a midwife 20 years and I have lost one mother and one mother. And then when we say babies, I'm going to say babies that came in alive into labor. Um, one baby that was born and then died subsequently after of complications. And then as far as people coming in with a baby that is not alive, like they present to the office or to the hospital a few times more than that, like maybe a few times a year. Um, and how do you deal with it? I tell you the way I deal with it is that I feel like my role is to be with women still in that situation. There's not a better person in my opinion to be with a woman or a family who's lost uh, a baby or a mother than a midwife. And we, Birth and death to me are very similar processes in that it's so spiritual and emotional as well as physical. And so the need to be with people. Um, thank you, Tanya. It is good to cry with them. It becomes part of our story. You know, I can tell you the stories of the, the ones that I have um, been with and even the ones who've come in and their babies were not alive when they came in. And, and it is like they remember you and they remember your kindness and your consideration of them and the time that you spend with them. And yes, it is hard. Fortunately, um, the good is the, like if you look at how much time do we have that is yay and happy and it's it's tremendous and the time that is grief is, is small, but it is impactful so you don't ever forget it. How do you deal with other healthcare providers that aren't the most receptive of midwifery care? Um, don't seem to be keen on other ways than the hospital way. I think some of the things that you do is you build relationships. So I'm going to not probably not go into this next section of, of slides. I think what we're talking about right now is too important. So I'm going to back up for a second. And then if we, if we get to these other things, that's fine. Um, you build relationships and then over time and as you honor women and their requests and you sh you share evidence in a non-threatening way with other people not like to say hey you're stupid you're not doing this but to say hey have you thought about this um i have found that the respect that you have for them and the respect that they have for you eventually that relationship grows possibilities for the women around you and possibilities for you to forge new ways to certain institutions. I have found that to be true where I am. Um, it is not quick, usually. Um, the evidence has to be presented, but more than that, the trust has to be there. So that would be my first response. And I see some people are typing, so that's good. I will read them to you as we get them. Now, if you've got a microphone, turn it on and talk. But otherwise, I'll, I will be your voice. Amanda, that's a great question, though. I will say that, you know, and I think there's another piece to that. So I'm going to take the opposite stance for a minute. And that is, you know, that we have a society of women who many of them are not really receptive to, um, to childbirth the way a midwife might envision it. So they might not have an interest in having an unmedicated birth or not having an epidural or whatever, right? So in that case, recognizing that it's the woman's birth, if she, if you have educated her and she's been offered options and the options that she chooses are not the options that you would choose, 
your job is still to be with her, to make her birth the best experience that it can be, and even if it's the hospital way. Um, Tanya says, make sure that you acknowledge that the whole team is what keeps moms and babies safe, yes. Thanking them for the part that they play in big and small ways. One of the things that I have learned to say to the physicians that I work with when they say, well, Tanya, uh, you know, Tanya will be there forever. They'll get, she'll eventually get the baby out vaginally. As I say, but thank goodness I've got you to call when that's not going to happen. Like, that's your role and you do it well. Thank goodness I can trust you that you're a great surgeon and hopefully you can trust me that I'm great in being with women and giving a woman every opportunity and hoping and believing that birth works. Any other questions or comments on this thread about life as a midwife, just generally? So I want to briefly talk as somebody's typing, I'm, I will move on a little bit about work-life balance because some of the questions were about how do you live this life? One of the ways that I have found to be successful is not to try to separate work and life. So I don't have a work-life balance per se. I more have um, an integration. So everything for me is life. Like my work is such an integral part of my life that not only can I not actually separate it per se, I don't want to. Um, and so I find that recognizing that you can integrate these things as like the, my work folks at work know all about family and my family knows all about my work other than HIPAA violations. They don't know big patients names and et cetera, but that belief and understanding that you work to pull things together all, all around and within help you to do it. Our, what we need to be successful is always changing and it's different for everybody. So I don't have work-life separation. It might work for you and that if it does and that that's great for me, I just have to pull it all together and I've kind of moved seamlessly from one to the other and sometimes doing both. Now resilience, however, is being able to adapt. And so when you adapt in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threat, et cetera, that ability to do that is resilience. And resilience is extremely important in being a nurse midwifery student and in becoming a nurse midwife. The ability to take on, and in this situation, this just happens to be my little baby Seth, um, about how he faced some really big adversity, um, paraplegia, and found ways to just keep going. And you know, it's interesting, there's some people that can, it seems like whatever life throws at them, they can just kind of move on through it and other people have more difficulty doing that. But being, um, just recognizing the role of resilience. Emma, thank you for that question. How much does your personal, how much do your personal religious beliefs affect how you do your job? Do you ever run into conflicts? I'm sorry, some, one of my computers just did something and all the lights went off. Um, Yes, I do sometimes run into conflict. Um, and I think that anybody's personal beliefs or personal religious beliefs, however you want to angle that, can sometimes cause you to be in a situation that is that you might find, feel is a conflict. And so, um, you know, you thank y'all. Y'all were just awesome seg helping me segue to the next. One of the things that I do is to pay attention to the body, the mind, emotion, and the spirit. And for me, that is religious, but for some people it's not. The spiritual needs that each person has. And to always feel like I have to trust that for myself. I have to honor that in, in a way that does not, um, that does not walk into other people's belief systems, but allows us to run side by side with them, even if they're in conflict to mine or at odds with my personal belief system, to recognize that I honor their beliefs. I might not agree with them. They might not agree with mine, but that doesn't mean that I don't honor them as a person and that I don't care more about each individual. I care more about loving that person than I do hating their, or hating so strong word, 
disagreeing with their beliefs. Does that make sense? So I have said that in, in different ways, but mainly, I guess, let me restate it and see if I can get it just right this time. I would prefer to care about each person more than disagree with or try to um, convince them of a belief that I might have that's in conflict with theirs. And so in honoring them in that way, that says, I think more about our character than it does if we're trying to win somebody over or convince them of something that, that is in conflict with what they think or believe. And I don't find that that does not make me feel conflicted. To love people does not make me feel conflicted. So going into each room every day, attending to each of these parts of who we are so that we can be, oh, Shannon, thank you, so that we can be ready to, um, to move forward. Emma, I hope I answered your question. Do you feel like I answered it? That's a great question and a hard question to answer. And since that made me stressed, maybe I should have a dessert. <laughs> what do y'all think? Do, do we deserve a dessert after this? You would th thank you, Gen Jennifer, thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question, but really, <laughs> And so I've been talking a lot about looking after yourself, but sometimes that also means treating yourself. So, and certainly every single time you feel stressed, don't pick up a dessert, but, um, but there are appropriate times to relax and enjoy yourself. This is me with some of our students. I tell you, there's nothing better than midwifery students to like reignite me and make me feel um, proud to be a part of the university and part of the profession. And, so this is one of the last slides that I have tonight, and then I'm going to take more questions if we have them. I hope we do. And that is that um, there are always going to be things that are hard. There are going to be things that you do right. There are going to be things that you do wrong. I probably stepped over some words tonight as I was answering your question. But when you decide to do the right thing, to try to do the right thing, to put the hard work in, you can't be bound. There's not much that can bind you. Um, it is the possibilities are limitless. And I am so honored to be here with y'all tonight that you felt led to attend at seven o'clock on a whatever day this is, Tuesday evening. Um, I'm honored that you're here. Those of you who are watching later, I'm honored that you took the time to do that. I hope that you will pursue your, if you're here, then you have a dream or a glimmer of a dream, like you're thinking about being a midwife or you're in the program already. I can't tell you, I cannot say emphatically enough that this profession is a profession for a lifetime. It's a profession that allows you to touch so many people and to impact so many lives. It is the best choice I ever made professionally in my life. And the only thing I like better than being a midwife is kissing my very own babies. So, which there are three of them. Any other um, questions or comments? So now we're kind of at the end, but we have some time. I would love to answer any questions. I'm gonna put a slide up that has, if you're interested in becoming a nurse midwife, you can go to that www.frontier.edu. Take the dive, it's worth it. It's scary sometime, um, but so, so worth it. Any of the other students that came to participate have any? Yep, Jennifer, you got any words of wisdom? Anybody else have words of wisdom? I don't know if I have words of wisdom, but I will add um, that if anyone's thinking about um, pursuing this dream, I highly recommend considering um, Frontier because um, you were talking earlier about being, you know, you were being transparent with us, and I felt like um, everybody from the librarian to the financial aid people to the IT people, everybody abound seems so transparent and so genuine and um, seem to truly enjoy each other and care about each other. Um, and it's a very diverse group, lots of different personalities there, but um, everybody, the joy in what you guys are doing comes through and everybody leaves there feeling so supported 
and um, all these situations you were talking about with um, spiritual conflicts and um, you know life events, and I, I truly feel like um, with such an an amazing and diverse faculty that there's always going to be somebody like if I called you and said or emailed you and said, hey, I'm having this issue, you're going to say, oh, you know who the best person is to talk about that? It's going to be this person. And um, you don't get that anywhere else. I mean, everywhere I have um, been on my educational path, it has been a much bigger divide between um, faculty and students. And you guys treat us like people. Thank you, Jennifer, for saying that. And I found that kind of approach also worked in practice. So if somebody came in, um, into practice and had a question, just like you would do if somebody came in with a complicated endocrinology question. I might, I'm not, I am not the best person to ask answer that. I'm really not. I'm going to send you to the best person. It's the same thing with ethical issues or others. I'm going to give you a framework and then I'm going to try to give you the best resource. Like we can't be everything to every single person, but we can kind of be a repository as to help to move people to the right resource for them. Oh, Shannon, I'm so glad you're gonna be there on November 4th. That Frontier Bound, I will actually be there. Um, will we leave with a clear vision of how we proceed, how to start looking? Yes, I think you will. I will have to find a preceptor and have to travel. Yes, don't be nervous about that. Um, I live in little bitty Dublin, Georgia. Um, it's about three, and a, three or so hours, three plus hours from Atlanta. And pardon me, I had to travel for, pre, for my clinical. And I would go, I had three boys already. I would go and stay three or four days at a time and then come home two or three days, go back, three, four, so forth and so on. Um, Julie, you're next. And then I, y'all share this, share what you have to say, folks. All of you students, come on now. I just wanted to say, um, you know, for me, it's been really important to kind of remember that, that initial spark and that passion. And that really helps to kind of propel me through when I'm having those rough moments. So whether that's writing writing down a big why or a vision board or something like that for you, you know, that it's really important just um, to be able to reflect back on that when things do get hard because there's going to be times that are really difficult uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, with that being said, you know, even though it's a distance program and we touched on this a little bit, there are so many people to support you. Um, you know, I left Frontier Bound with one group chat of my uh, or group text with, with my color group and then a group text with my roommates and we are on that all the time talking to each other and there's also um, you know a pretty strong Facebook group presence that is able to help and assist and you know you're really really truly never alone in in this program unless you're just choosing to be um, because there's so many resources and so many people that want to see you fulfill that that passion and that desire um, and I'm, I don't regret any moment of, of choosing to come to Frontier and being on this path and just really grateful to be surrounded by all of the people here and, and throughout the whole, the whole university. Yeah, I have to second everything that Julie said. It's um, amazing, like I said before, just how much community you feel with this program. Um, exactly what Julie said, the same thing, like have, they actually told us when you create your workspace at home, put up affirmations or put up letters or put up things that remind you of what you're passionate about. For me personally, I've kept like every card, every letter, every note, every, um, text message or like Facebook post from anyone who has, you know, either been my patient and said like, you were a great labor nurse, like you're gonna be a great midwife, anything like that. And when I have like a moment where I'm doubting why I'm doing this and why I'm killing myself to do this, I just read through that and I'm like, this is why, this is exactly why. So that's super helpful. Um, just like Julie said, I was part of the Aqua group when I went to Frontier Bound, which was two years ago. And we still like talk daily in that group. Like we're always texting each other. And the great thing is in this program, like even though we all went to Frontier Bound, we all found our different routes. Like two of the girls got pregnant and they both had babies during this program. So that one took a hiatus for one term, one took a hiatus for two terms, some powered through and did, you know, three courses per term and they're already graduated, you know, and then like some of us are in clinical. So Frontier really allows you to go at your pace and they're very um, open to like life happens. Just let us know and we'll work around it. And they really want you to succeed. Like 
I can tell you so many professors that like I am only here today because of how empowering they were and how much they cared for me personally that I made it through. Like it wasn't just like, oh, you're another midwifery student. It was like, you're struggling. Let me help you. They will meet with you individually on these BBBs or on um, Google Hangouts. And they're just very, very personal. And I know that I recommend it to everyone. Anyone of my labor nurse, labor and delivery nurses are like, I want to be a midwife for anyone who just wants to be a midwife in general. I'm like, go to Frontier. Like you will not regret it. It's the best program that you can find. So highly recommend. I'm going to answer one question out loud here that's in the chat. And then Triana, if you would say, if you would um, help us out here and, and share what your wisdom is. Jennifer Spielman is asking about she says, I'm in the process of applying now. I'm curious about the type of online learning. My BSing was a lot of read chapters X, Y, Z and post discussion post and reply to two. Is Frontier similar? I would say, I would say no, I'm not going to say that never ever happens, but there are lots of recorded lectures. There are some um, time and place that you get together and do discussions, some that are not time and place. There are some online simulations where you're in a room like this and you're actually working with a labor patient. So there, there's a lot of variety in the um, learning, in the approach to learning, teaching and learning. All right, Triana. Yeah, I just, I was gonna be pretty brief in what I wanted to say about Frontier, but it's it's definitely an awesome program, you guys, for anyone that's considering going. Um, I was not a labor and delivery nurse. I'm not a labor and delivery nurse, and I'm in the um, midwifery program. I'm actually a NICU nurse, and that's what I'm still doing now. I work part-time. And so for anyone that's considering midwifery that doesn't have that labor and delivery experience, it's not an end all, you're not gonna get in. Um, I applied and, and did get in. And so I've done one term at Frontier. I just started the summer term. And so um, I got all A's. And so it's, it's very doable. I've got two kids, I'm married. And so life, you do have to manage your life. You have to really work on your schedule and figure out um, how to fit everything in, but it is doable. It is possible. And um, words of encouragement, you can do it and definitely apply if you um, are thinking about being a midwife because Frontier is definitely where you want to be. Um, it has been wonderful. We are so close with all of the, everyone that I met at Frontier Bound. Um, we're all like on Facebook together and we encourage each other and anytime anyone has any questions, we kind of, you know, we all answer each other's questions. So it's, you'll definitely um, learn a lot from, from everybody. So um, definitely apply. You should, you, you won't be um, disappointed. You'll be definitely, it's, it's a great program. Thank you. So I'm going to finish this up tonight um, just by saying thank you for joining. Thank you for all of the wisdom that some of our students, our current students, lended in doing this. Thank you for your questions. I hope we answered them. If we didn't, I am typing my email into the chat and I want you to email me. Oops, that should be edu at the end. Um, for those of you who are watching later, it's Tanya, T-O-N-Y-A dot Nicholson at Frontier dot edu. If I don't have the best resource for the answer, I'll connect you with the best person. Um, and some of you were talking about your vision boards or your encouragement boards. I do the very same thing. I have notes from some of the faculty, notes from some of the students, notes from women um, who I've attended their births that help me because there are hard days. And on those hard days, you need a, you need a word and you need somebody to surround you. So um, thank you for being here tonight. I hope to, oh, and somebody's at Frontier Bell November the 18th. I'm at that one too. I've got two this term and two of you are here. Yay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for everything. And um, please email with me with any questions and thanks to the faculty and students that are here. Good night.